Hi, you're listening to Marsha Pally and conversations I'm having with people about the criteria we should use to design and implement our economic and political policies. What should be our basic framework for determining public policy? These conversations are based on ideas from a book of mine, Commonwealth and Covenant, Economics, Politics, and Theologies of Relationality, because we're looking specifically at relationality as this framework for policy. Relationality includes both the individual person and the relations and contexts that he or she is in. Relationality is developed in many of our philosophical traditions and also in several theological traditions. Whether you think theologies are the word of the divine or an illuminating metaphor, in both cases they offer us much about how the world and people work and so about the policies that will lead to the greatest human flourishing. Please join us in this series of conversations. Commonwealth and Covenant was published by Erdman's Press in 2016. You can follow me at marshapally.com or search for me on Facebook and Twitter. about the term economic trinity. Um, economic is an interesting term for, des for designating what it is, which is the trinity in, let's, let's say in my words, active in the realm of humanity. Okay. Uh, economic means uh, there's a gain, or there's a, in economy means that there is a, yeah, there's a, um, a taking care of resources. Or why is it called economic? That's it's not my term. I know, right. but I'm, I, I'm aware of that. But it, it, it goes on in the, all, in, in the next pages. So was, at the end it says, when, on page Maltman, Maltman's account 229, on Maltman's account, when the economic work of the sun, which is salvation and spirit, sanctification is complete, agape and peace will reign. Um, mm -hmm. What does it mean, what does it mean with economic? It's just my... Um, um, Maybe t connected to time. So what is what what for you does the econo I mean does the term the economic trinity mean before we look mm -hmm. at Maltman's yes. provocative idea? What I said is, uh, uh, is the, the, what did I say, it's like um, the working of Trinity in the realm of humanness, yeah. of humanity, of humanness, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the effect of the working, not the working, the existence. Let me throw one idea out, right, so um, it's, not, it's not profit, economy is not profit or gain mm -hmm. here. Um, but I, I think that you actually have picked up what's meant by the term in its essence, because um, in the sense of creating an economy that includes the cause of causes, God, the divine, and humanity. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, in reading this, I, I also wondered about the term ecology, right? Like an ecosystem. Yeah, that you can, right, thinking about um, an ecosystem, this is metaphorical, right, um, that would include the divine, and in this case the Trinitarian divine, mm -hmm. and humanity. So you have this ecosystem or mm -hmm. economy mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, uh, in which there is, as you said, interaction. And not only in one direction, mm -hmm. because as we just read with, with Baker, mm -hmm. right, the 
humanity responds back to the communication of the divine. And the quote is, on Moltmann's account, when the econo e e economic work of the sun, in bracket salvation, and spirit, in bracket sanctification, is complete, agape and peace will reign. What God now economically communicates to us, and what God imminently is, will be one. The inner relations of the triune God, agape, gift, will be our relations with each other and the state of the world. Okay. Well, he seems to link them together in saying that after when the economy, the economic work is done, the imminent, um, the imminent trinity will be complete. Is that that when the um, the economic work <coughs> is done, meaning the work of God communicating God to humanity is done, then in fact um, that the characteristic again, I'm being anthropomorphic here, the characteristics of the internal Trinity will, in some sense, be have been spread into humanity. Mm -hmm. And things like agape, you know, friendship for the sake of the other, gift for the flourishing of the other, um, those are not the condition of humanity today, mm -hmm. I think we can safely say. But in some unknown condition, yes. when the communication of the economic trinity of God's nature to us is complete, then we will also be agape and giving and gift giving. So that the hmm, characteristics, features of the imminent trinity will be our characteristics too at this unknown condition and uh, circumstance, time. Hmm. Because um, this kind of communicating means setting, setting up the house and that's the original notion of this word economy. Oh. Was um, how you have to set a house so that it works. So um, even Aristotle was talking about how um, economy, a, a house and oil house has to be organized so that it works afterwards. And so it economically means God is communicating in a way that He is setting up the rules um, of the house in which, after He communicated them, these rules rule. Well, I think, you, Julie, that's what he means when he says it will be, mm -hmm. the economy economic will be complete, right? Mm -hmm. it will, the communication at this time, mm -hmm. the communication will have been communicated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, whatever the internal workings of the imminent trinity are, agape, gift, mm -hmm. do, charity, donation without loss, and so on, will then have been successfully, so to speak, communicated to humanity. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, in, in, in taking it from the ancient Greek use of the oikonomia, then the house works. Yeah. <laughs> the household works. Yeah. Did, did any of you have, have a reaction to Moltmann's idea that the human community as a whole is the entity in God's triune image, not that um, as God is the unity of multiplicities, right? That's the triune idea. So uh, humanity in his image is the unity of many people, that it's the entire human community that is in the image of God. If we're in God's image, it's not each of us who is in God's image, but his emphasis is that, what did you mean by that? Yeah, all humanity. Yeah, yeah. that all of humanity in the aggregate is in God's image. That idea bothers a lot of people. It bothers some of the people I've already mentioned because there's not enough regard for the individual person. But it doesn't bother you. So how did you understand it? I thought you meant um, the, um, every single person, every individual is included, so to say. It's a potential, so to say. And um, so.
wenn du mir die Image of God, um, then we are, uh, then it unfolds in time, the potential of, of, of humankind unfolds as a single human in time. So, um, and when you try to come close to understand God, you have to accept that time doesn't matter for you. And thus, um, our conception of uh, being humans as single humans doesn't matter. So it's our concept of taking humans as humans or humanity as humans and seeing the humans, but for the view of God it doesn't matter because some views different and presume. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's exactly what spooks some of the other people, right? That the idea that humanity as a community is in the image of God bothers some people because they want to, because they fear um, the loss of each person in the image of God. And the right? personal relation. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, then you sort of get this aggregate mm -hmm. picture, and that spooks some people. Right? Sure. Yeah. Maybe it's also important to take a philological look, because the terms are father and son, and that are terms from the human world, the family, and that terms are linked to images from, from everyday life. Everybody has a, an idea of a father or a son. And so if we say God is uh, the father and the son and one, then these images that are linked to these terms are included. you want to come close and make a make make no, no picture, what does it say in English? Um, don't make a book. So image, you know, don't find an image for God. So um, when we're talking about Trinity, it's very close to to exactly doing this. When we're talking about the course of courses, it's it has an abstract level that, that allows a lot of interpretation and is not so um, not so, so so easy to be um, misused, so to say, because course of course is okay. But um, Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, um, they're very, very close to um, idolatry. Or I think that's the problem with Trinity at all. But, um, all of our terms, and you've, picked, you know, you've, you've come down right on, the, on one of the points, all of our terms of talking about something like the cause of causes, God, that it's immaterial, incorporeal, out of time, will use our terms. And in some sense, that in that, they're all limited and they're all wrong and they are vulnerable to misuse. You, then you start taking the metaphor literally, right, and thinking. That's the um, uh, serious critique of all the apophatic theologians of Via Negativa, starting with Maimonides and Aquinas, Aquinas all the way down to the current day, um, to be very, very careful knowing um, that you really can't talk about God. There are other uses of apophatic um, theology that say yes, that's true. Um, so what, we, what can we do with our metaphors and symbols? Then what can we learn from our, without making the mistake of taking our metaphors for real? Yeah, of course, but we still use these metaphors. And I think that's not just uh, an accident. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, those, that's, that's the argument about, about the via negativa or the, or the apophatic theology. We can't talk about this unless we use metaphors, symbols, images, and so on. So should we not talk about it? Or what kind of discipline do we have to keep reminding ourselves when we use these metaphors?